Welcome, everybody, back uh, to Siegel Talks here at the Martin Siegel Theater Center in Midtown Manhattan. It's a beautiful day in New York City. Uh, sun is out and the first leaves are coming out like fingertips, uh, uh, like beautiful manicured fingertips of nature. And we have with us a great, great theater artist, um, one of the uh, distinguished great ones who we all know about, who we love, who we adore. And, uh, and it is so great to hear from him. Bob Wilson is with us. Bob, thank you for taking the time. Thank you. That's uh, just an incredible. Bob is one of the artists that uh, made New York City a superpower in theater. It comes out of a time when we had Joseph Chaikin and the Living Theater, La Mama, Meredith Monk, John Cage, Merce Cunningham, Trisha Brown, the Wooster Group, the great Mabu Minds we just lost, Lee Brewer, Reza Abdul, Jerome Robbins, the great Jerome Balanchine. It's a time you know, when New York theater was a New York um, um, theater and uh, no one, you know, has uh, put a stamp in, in a way on it. Also globally like Bob, since Max Reinhardt, who was a great German director in the 20s and 30s, um, uh, you know, he has uh, done work that spans a globe. It's truly global, it's eclectic, it's diverse. But every, all the stuff we talk about, he always cared deeply deeply about community. We do not know that uh, enough, I think. And I remember I read something once when someone talked to Merce Cunningham and uh, Cunningham, you know, was a bit shy and someone talked about him and I think uh, it was John Cage who said, you know, you are the moon. You, some people would talk about it, they are the finger that point to the moon, but that's not the moon. But Bob uh, with us, I think, uh, is the moon. He's in Watermill, which is a great, great, contemporary art center, one of the greatest in the world. If this would be in Europe, they would have to put guards around it that people would try to, to sneak in and to be with it. And um, Bob, I'm sorry I talk so much. Our Siegel Talks, we have now talked to over 150 artists from 50 countries. We were the only theater institution creating new uh, uh, content every day of the week during the time of Corona. It looks much better now. Um, so, but it's all about listening and we would love to hear from you. First, Bob, if I can ask you, how are you? I'm fine. I've, I've been here at the Watermill Center since uh, December. So, but I leave at the end of next week. I'll go to Germany and we'll start working in elsewhere. It's been wonderful to be on Long Island. You know, Long Island is a it's a special place and it's a place where artists have come for for centuries because one is because of the light this long island in the middle of the atlantic ocean and uh, it's extraordinary light all times of the year and usually for winter and spring i'm not here so it's been wonderful to experience uh, the Watermill Center this time of year, and especially to see the early morning light and the evening light. And it's, uh, I'm grateful for this time. Yeah, incredible to think that someone like you who moves so much, who works so hard, I don't know anybody who works more and harder than you do, um, and that uh, you can't do your work. Where were you when Corona started? I, I was in Berlin, and uh, I was actually in Marrakesh, and then I went to Berlin, and then I, I was in Berlin for four months, and uh, then went to France, and uh, I was able to produce a little work. I did uh, uh, <clears throat> the Messiah of Mozart. And, uh, I did that in Paris, and later Geneva. And I had created it at the beginning of uh, last year in Salzburg. Yeah, yeah, in, in, incredible. And um, now we, we all uh, think about theater. So in the moment, we cannot do it. Um, so many people now say, you know, we have to go out in the parks, find out what could be done. I think work outside in nature has always been 
part of your artistic practice? Well, I came to New York uh, in my early 20s uh, from, from Texas. Um, and I started working with um, special education with children with learning difficulties, uh, uh, a whole mixed bag of people, people in iron lungs. I worked with um, housewives, I worked with uh, uh, Head Start programs, preschool children, children in the first grade, um, uh, children from wealthy communities, from depressed communities, um, people of all ages. And then I slowly became a part of uh, the art movement that was happening in lower Manhattan, which later became known as Soho. I had moved to Lower Manhattan in 1965, just before Donald Judd, the sculptor, had moved just down the street, or Paula Cooper had opened a gallery. And uh, I had, for the first time in my life, a, a large space, 25 feet by 75. And uh, it was an empty, large, empty space. And it was there I created all of my early works in the theater, made drawings and dance pieces. And I continued to work in, in and around Manhattan even when I started going to Europe and getting invitations to perform all over the world. And towards the end of the 80s, I was thinking maybe to stop working in the theater, to do something else. Um, anyway, I made the decision to acquire a piece of property uh, on Long Island. And I wanted to move out of the city and to be with nature. And uh, so I was fortunate to find um, this building in Watermill, which is in the township of Southampton. It was a building that had been abandoned in 1959. It was a laboratory for scientists who did experiments in telecommunications. And it reminded me a little bit of my loft that I had in lower Manhattan in the 60s. And I wanted to create a, a center, an international center for the arts and for the humanities and, and do work that I couldn't do, let's say, the Paris Opera, the Piccolo Teatro, the Schau Muna in Berlin, uh, established institutions in and around the world. And my first play was written with a a young Afro-American boy who'd never been to school and knew no words. He was deaf. And that, that play was seven hours long in silo. And my first play that uh, had a text was written with an autistic boy, uh, Christopher Knowles, who was putting together words in a mathematical uh, way. He was very concerned with uh, geometry, the use of language. Um, it was visually arresting uh, compositions. And, uh, I became fascinated with his writing, and my first play with words was written with him. Uh, and I went on to make other works, which I realized in the end of the 80s that to create those kind of works would be very difficult to do in established institutions. And I wanted to go back to my roots. So I came here to Long Island, to Watermill, and established uh, the center here in this uh, factory-like building. It's, uh, in the 50s, they had 250 employees working for Western Union at the time. Uh, so it was a, a 
place where I could do things that I couldn't do elsewhere. You know, he said, we have to do what no one else is doing. So, and uh, in the following years, I was fortunate to inquire some of the property around us who were situated in 10 and a half acres of land. Um, but it's been especially meaningful to this past year with the virus and the situation with Corona to be here in a in nature, in a natural environment. It was one of the reasons I moved from Manhattan to, to here in 1989. Mm -hmm. Incredible. I, I remember seeing once a proposal you wrote, I think for the top of the World Trade Center, also kind of a research center to be, if I, I hope I'm right, you had that vision, that idea that scientists and artists, people who are not performers, people come together and work, even at the time when you were a small company and were not famous yet, you already had that vision. Uh, is, that, is that right that you had a, on the top, you wanted to have a top of the World Trade Center as, as for work? That's correct. And I, uh, I wanted to bring people together from not only uh, the arts, but uh, from other fields and, and math and science and anthropology. And, uh, I think all too often uh, we, as artists, we get uh, uh, very, we're very narrow-minded. You know, we know about one thing. But uh, I was very much influenced by a man named Daniel Stern, who was. Uh, head of the Department of Psychology at Columbia University. Uh, we bonded and became very close friends. And when uh, Raymond Andrews, the deaf mute boy, came to live with me, uh, Dan was a, a close ally. Dan was working uh, with mothers and babies in pre-verbal communication. Mm. Study with with babies and, and mothers uh, before there were, there were speaking words, as we know words. And uh, he was fascinated at how Raymond's uh, mind worked because Raymond was intelligent, highly intelligent in some areas, but he thought in terms of visual signs and signals, and he would often see things that you and I maybe would not see because he was preoccupied on uh, what he was seeing. So that had a tremendous influence on, mm. on the work I'm doing now and yeah. has been all my life. But uh, it was a confirmation meeting uh, Daniel Stern, who was a scientist and from a completely different field. Uh, yeah. I mean, what is, is so incredible also with Raymond Andrews, and I think people don't know that, and I think you don't talk about it so often. I think you were on the way to New Jersey for your seminars to make some money in Maplewood or wherever it was, and he was beaten by a police. Yeah. And um, you saw him on the street with a black boy. He couldn't even understand that the police, of course, didn't notice, didn't realize he was five, one of five, six, seven uh, foster children, I think. Uh, and um, you said, so you intervened and a uh, policeman said, what do you, why do you care? And you said, and you said, you know, I want to do my civic duty. So it is an incredible moment uh, where art intersected in, in reality um, at a time when there was, you know, the broken window theory is like one window breaks and then, you know, the whole building goes down and the neighborhood, so we have to arrest anyone. What Bob did, which I think is so incredible, he said, come with me to my workshop. I'm interested in your dreams. I'm interested in your drawings. What can I learn from you? You know, and you helped him to get out of that family that he also didn't understand that he was, I mean, this is something incredible. Um, and what you do, and I think your work in Watermill is uh, connected that you have also be uh, giving 
residencies to, to, to artists um, in there. So I would like to, to hear from you about this idea. You are not, I mean, you are a great artist and you have great success and you make some money, but you're nowhere near a Brad Pitt or a, a George Clooney who paid 20, 30 millions for, for 10 days. You, you struggle so hard to create watermill. And what does it mean to you? Well, I think you, you learn by living. And uh, if I'd gone to Yale or if I'd gone to a drama school, Northwestern or whatever, I would never be making the kind of theater I'm, I'm making. The work I do in the theater uh, came about uh, living life. I was walking down the street in Summit, New Jersey, and I saw a, a policeman about to hit a boy over the head with a club. And I grabbed his arm and said, why do you hit the boy? And the policeman said, it's none of your business. And I said, but it is. I'm a responsible citizen. And as a result, uh, I got to know the boy and uh, his particular situation. And I thought I thought in words, and I thought he was intelligent, perhaps highly intelligent. And it was apparent that uh, he knew no words, and he thought in terms of visual signs and signals. So my first play was written with him. Um, it was not something I was planning to do or had necessarily, necessarily even wanted to do. It just is something that happened. And um, the same thing with uh, Christopher Gold. It was by chance I met him and saw his, the writing he was doing. And he came to stay with me and worked with a small group of people. And my first plays were how I had been silent. And, then I had texts of Christopher Knowles that were organized like music. Uh, those things would not have happened in uh, big institutions that are, where we have we are the big theater. Uh, yeah, we go and in, and it was, uh, so incredible. On one hand, you have that hand writing. One can really see this. What I think uh, Susan uh, sometimes said. You know, that's when you see an artist's work in a picture or a, and you know from whom it's from you see the handwriting that's a great artist and you do that but yet with Raymond and also with Christopher you were interested truly interested in the minds of others and put it into a form so radically different from what you are taught you know and it's all about your own realization um, of things so you in a way did both and uh, this is incredible and um and I think also something that art can do instead, you know, it's just saying we have to have better foster care, we have to, you know, help the kid and get to school, but also to say engage um, um, as in the arts, in the community, in a place where you helped him and to connect and also, of course, um, um, uh, Christopher. I know you went early also, if I'm right, to Watermill, right, as a as a young kid, uh, you were also not known. And Jerome Robbins br brought you to Watermill to his center. Was that an inspiration for you? Well, I I was fortunate that I, for a period of time, I was an assistant to Jerome Robbins, and then um, two summers he rented a house here in Watermill. Uh, I stayed in the house with. with with him for, that he rented. Uh, at that time, I had no idea that <clears throat> I would ever work in the theater. Uh, in fact, I was not so interested in theater. I was interested in, in being a painter. I was not a good painter. But there were other things that would interest me more. So I ended up working in the theater, but I learned a lot from Jerry. More and more as I'm older, I realized that, uh, how much I learned from him, things he said, the way he talked about, the way he talked about theater. Jerry said that 
most important second in theater is the last. The next is the first. Be sure to get the first second right. He was brilliant in the way he, in time and space, constructed his work. And, and did you do an outdoor uh, work there? I spoke with Noah, but who also helped me, you know, to, to, to prepare for it and all your outdoor work. But the, I wasn't aware you did the work in that time uh, outside. Uh, I made in the, yes, I did make in the late 60s, I made a, a film with, uh, here at Watermill. Um, Incredible. Mm. Yeah, with, with Jerry and a group of young people that I had met, and older people, uh, and we filmed it outside in a field. Hmm. So to, maybe also I think Car Mountain in a way. I mean, everybody is now thinking we don't have theaters, we can't go in. Um, big theaters also with budget say we cannot do everything is closed, artists are out of work, but you always Continued and also your one of your great works, uh, Car Mountain, I think seventy two in New York. It was completely outside, and a lot of people don't know about it. Can, can you tell us a bit about that idea you had, how to do something outside? Right. Well, I had been asked uh, in nineteen seventy one. I did the Deaf Man Glance in, in Paris. That was a seven hour uh, long play that was silent. And um, the Fred Faradiba, the Shabadu of Iran, uh, came to see it several times. And she said she would like to present it in, uh, in Iran. And um, uh, they had a festival in Shiraz. And she said, perhaps it's the festival in Shiraz or even Tehran. But there were no theaters, uh, Western style theaters uh, in Iran. So I went and um, I was expected to do something in Persepolis. And uh, it's so overpowering and so interesting and beautiful. That I'm, was overwhelmed. I was staying in Shiraz and I went into the foothills just outside of uh, Shiraz and uh, liked the being in the barrenness of, of the desert. And so I thought to create a work uh, in these foothills. And I was there on several different occasions, and I discovered that there were seven foothills. Um, they got progressively higher. Um, from the highest peak, there was an incredible overview of the desert. And at the base of the first hill was a graveyard were Sufi poets, and uh, it was an oasis, a garden with uh, fruit trees and fountains, and a beautiful 17th century uh, building, uh, and so I thought that maybe this started with this oasis, this Sufi seven Sufi poets have been buried in this garden in the 13th century uh, to start there and to build a piece outdoors. Uh, so it turned out to be seven days long. And the first day was on the first hill and the second day and then hill one and two and the third day on hill one, two, three until by the seventh day, there were activities happening on all seven hills. And uh, we worked with uh, people from Latin America, from North America. I brought uh, 
students, uh, factory workers, uh, housewives from New Jersey, uh, young people, middle-aged people from Europe and Central Europe, and um, working with people from Shiraz and uh, students uh, had an elderly man who told stories in the bazaar in, in Shiraz and uh, we built a, a big whale and uh, could go inside this whale and sit in, and the old man told stories uh, in Persian we had a, a Sufi poet who spoke in another location. Um, I built the, the structure in such a way that, um, say, day one had a plan that started at midnight and went to midnight of the next day. And the first day had a theme of a flood. And I had 156 people. Um, we had gathered to perform in the piece. So we broke it down in different groups. And let's say group one is uh, 25 people or something. And they took the first hour from midnight to 1 a.m. and created a on the first hill, something that had to do with the flood. And then the second group had from 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. And their theme was, was a flood and they could do whatever they want. And so each day had a theme. And the second day, the group one came back and they had their slot of time from uh, midnight to one. And we created together uh, this seven day play. So what I did was outline a big mega structure. And uh, I did only one section was from, I think it was from eight to nine each evening. And uh, so it would be impossible for me to write a play that would be seven days long, but I, I made a, a mega structure. Yeah. The way an architect, or let's say an art, yeah, designs a city, or the way an architect designs a building. So this is a building. And uh, then Frank lives in the building and he wants his apartment to be like that. And I live in the building and I want my apartment to be like that. And someone else lives in the apartment and wants their apartment to be like that. And we all fill in our apartments with our own personalities, but there is a cohesion because there is a megastructure. So what I did to create uh, the seven day play uh, is to make a big mega structure. And then I worked with this group of people uh, and each one began to fill in their, their areas, their time slots, the way they wanted. And because we had themes for each day for the seven days, in some ways there was um, a cohesion. And uh, so you could come and go um, with all outdoors. If you wanted to go at two in the morning, you could go. If you wanted to go on a coffee break at two in the afternoon, you could go. If you wanted to go early in the morning and watch the sunrise, you could go. Uh, it was, uh, that time I was thinking about maybe not, not there shouldn't be too much difference between art and living. That uh, so that sometimes there was someone just making a salad or 
very ordinary thing. So we put it in the frame of theater. Uh, but that not being too much difference between art and living, that it would always be going on the way you can go to a park and, uh, on your day off, or you can go on a coffee break to the park and sit, reflect, watch trees move, people move, uh, a bird or, or whatever. You can day drink. Um, but this would always be going on. So the play would be always there. Um, so that is the kind of thing I was thinking about when I, I made the seven day play in the early 70s. Yeah, incredible um, to think about. Everybody knows, let's say, I don't, I'm just using the name public theater. They say we cannot do anything because, you know, the rooms are closed. We cannot rehearse the way we do, so we cannot do something. And there's a work done some already some time ago that seems so fresh, that seems so innovative created a community with 150 people performing. Just imagine how many people knew about it, were involved, enjoyed. I have a friend, Jishu, talks about seeing it. Others, it was a big moment in their lives of performers, life of Iran, what it stood for, what was possible in the time. And, um, and what just imagine someone would do something in five boroughs of New York City at the same time, a mega structure. We had the Siegel are thinking to create a New York Park project, you know, but something like this, what you already, I think, it had answers. It has answers for us in a time where we are all thinking, what shall we be doing? And stuff can be done also outside mm -hmm. the, in the free space we have. Now we forget that there's so much space in the world. If you're on an airplane and you look out the window, wow, it's so much space. Yeah. That is, that is true, and it's, it's also not, not thought of and not used. The idea of community, Bob, I know Watermill is a big community. For over 20 years or 25, people come every summer. Thousands of artists have, you know, uh, experimented. You gave them, as you said, encouragement. You said nothing is more important than encouragement for artists, especially young artists. It's been a staple now, even, you know, in, in Long Island, all of it. But the idea of community, and I know it's a serious one on your side, and it's on, but what does it mean to you? What, what is a community? Why is that important to you? You could be, you, I know you were offered to run big theaters in Germany. People said, forget about America. They don't treat you right. They don't love you as they should. Come and run the Hamburg Thalia Theater. I know that. And you said, no, I want to do something in Watermill. People said, it's crazy. It was at a time when uh, it was a financial crisis. The museum, I think the Brooklyn Museum was only closed one or two days, uh, open one or two days at the time because they didn't have the money for the guards. And Bob said, no, I want to do a big structure in, uh, in Long Island and do, go back to the idea of workshop stuff I can do. Why is that so important to you? And what does it mean to you? Well, I think that when I created the foundation, um, there were four basic principles. Um, one was that uh, in order for our community to be rich, that we must look to the past from where we came and that there should be some sort of balance of supporting work of our time, of creation, uh, but a balance of looking at uh, our history and where we came. And that it's important that we support our community, the people that are immediately around us, uh, in order for that community to be rich, we must inform ourselves of what's happening in the community at large. You know, what is happening in Afghanistan? What is happening in Bahia in the jungle? 
what is happening with the Eskimos, what is happening uh, with the Aboriginal peoples. Uh, so those were the four basic principles which we started the foundation. So a balance of interest and creating work of our time with a balance of interest and looking at the art of the past. Noel Manot, who helped write the bylaw, said if we don't look at the past and from where we came, we will always be provincial. And it's important then that we support what is happening in our local community, but for that local community to be rich, we must have some understanding of what's happening globally what's happening in other communities. By and large, uh, my tax dollar in the state of New York can only go to support the people of New York. Uh, so that if we want to be rich in New York City as a cultural capital of the world, uh, we must have an opportunity to see what's going on in the rest of the world. And so I have here at the Watermill building, uh, uh, Center a building that is a central building. Uh, and there's no door, just it's an opening. So from the street, there's no gate. You can walk in the property you can walk into the building, but there's no door. The Bible says, behold, I sat before thee an open door. And in the past few years with the current political environment, uh, it's been very difficult to bring certain people in, a Muslim or, or someone who has different religious beliefs than you, or, political ideas, uh, a different color of skin. Uh, so in an ideal way, we, we must keep the door open. Um, so we strongly support an open door policy. Um, can be someone with uh, no education. If, if, say, uh, if Raymond is never has no formal education. Uh, it's working with Raymond, I work with uh, Dan Stern with a high degree of education a scientist. So uh, keep the door open. Not easy. Yeah. Sure. What what do you make of the current political situation? Uh, of the times? Well, I mean yeah. Politics and religion will always divide us. And uh, so much of what we get in the media, you know, is a, the talk of politicians, the conflicts with people of different religions. But art and culture has a possibility to bring people together. And they, in that way, it can be unique in society. Um, it's the only thing that will remain 5,000 years from now, if anything does remain, is the artifacts of art. Go back 5,000 years ago, and we look at artifacts. Look at the Egyptians, look at the Chinese, look at the Mayans. 
the Egyptians, uh, or any culture, the Persians. We're looking at artifacts. Um, if we lose our roots, if we lose the knowledge of these artifacts, we lose our memory. And it's important to hear at the Watermill Center. I mean, the founders of this land are the Shinnecock Nation, the Native Americans who live nearby. There are forefathers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to get back to you that New York to stay as a true cultural city in the world needs to be global. I remember from you, but from others, if you would fill out uh, uh, to foundations or New York funding of the art, if you say you have an international collaborator, you were already disqualified. You wouldn't get funding, you know? And you had these little black boxes where you had to write in what you want to do. And if you would say, I have an international collaborator, you're out. You wouldn't get it. And um, I think Brecht said, uh, uh, the airplane, that's a good critique of the car. You know, someone didn't like the car. Said, well, let me think, but it didn't completely create it, you know, the idea of the airplane, the, the Wright brothers and so many others. You know, and I think what you did in Watermill also, you looked at theater and you adored so much of it. You know, the great, great Jerome Robbins also, who you knew and Balanchine and so many others. But you said, I'll create my own work as a, but I do something. I have in Watermill as a center, as a community, as a shining example of what a theater artist can do a single theater artist is uh, uh, stunning and um, and um, we all admire it um, uh, uh, so so very much i think you talked about the idea of a uh, of the diamond i know you studied interior architecture yeah. in, at Park in brooklyn you know in a way you are you are you design our interiors i always think like carl young said you know the dreams is the only thing that hasn't happened we create them, we see them, we write them, um, and, um, and, uh, and you create these designs for us to meditate, to look, to connect to the present and past. And, um, and uh, in, in a way, you know, this is a, a, a stunning, a, a stunning way to, to, to enrich um, all of us. So what do you, what do you feel, um, you know, is missing. What do you feel at the time we have now? What should what should happen? What's not there? What you miss so much? Um, I think that we have to be careful that our institutions don't become too institutionalized and too theoretical. like fire, it can destroy you or it can warm you. But uh, I think we need, uh, people need time and space uh, to think. And um, with our social media with our people congregating in cities and communities. We're bombarded with so much information that um, no time to, to think is um, more and more needed. I was talking with them um, young man, quite young, uh, who is from the Shinnecock Nation here. And he was speaking with one, this was last week, one of the elders uh, in the community of the Shinnecocks. And 
as the elder how how it was today as compared to how it was uh, 50 years ago. And he said, you know, everyone talks slower and people walk slower. And so their perceptions were different. And this is what the elder was telling him. That now the speech has become so rapid and I think it's one reason that I came to Long Island to be here in a natural environment. Uh, nature will affect our spiritual side. Um, I'm now looking out a window and I see um, a fir tree that's just barely moving in the air. It's amazing. It would be difficult to take the time to see that tree moving uh, in Manhattan. Yeah. When it comes to walking, you said that the, of the elder of the Shinnecock Nation that the walking was slower. You also created, I think, in Iceland, to shelling a walking performance, right? Where people, or it was called walking. Um, you might even redo it, but uh, here, but uh, what was the idea? Well, I this has to make a theatrical work in the island of Tres Shelling. Uh, that's on the north coast of mainland Holland. And I went there to look at location. And uh, on this island, there are no theaters. So I knew I would, if I did something, it would be outdoors. And I walked from the south side uh, to the north side, to the North Sea. And it took uh, about 45 minutes or 50 minutes at a normal pace. And so I made a piece eventually that was called walking, where it took five hours to walk from uh, the south side to the north side of the island, the long, narrow island. And uh, it went for some weeks or months and people came from the outside and they did this walk. And the people who lived on the island made the walk as well. And many of the people that lived on the island had been on the island all of their life. So they began to see things that they had not seen before, to hear things they had not heard before and that their perceptions were altered simply by taking more time. And uh, I stuttered when I was um, younger and uh, for years I would say, good, 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 good. I was stuttering. And I was 17 and I met a woman uh, named Bert Hoffman. She was called ballet to uh, local school, uh, local children in Waco, Texas. And uh, she heard me stuttering and she said, take more time. Slow your speech down. And I did. And within six weeks, I was more or less over the stuttering. And my parents had taken me to specialists in Chicago and St. Louis and elsewhere to overcome the stuttering. But it was this very simple 
thing that is, she said, take more time. It was as if I was speeding in place. Um, so I think that the difficulties we've had in this corona virus and in some ways it's been a blessing because it's given many of us more time for re re reflection. Did it change you that, that, I mean, I know how much you work, how far you planned it once, how even for us that you gave us today the time, you know, it's, I know how filled your schedules are. Did this change you uh, now that time of course did it? Or did it confirm something? Are you different, Bob, than last March? Uh, I think it was John Cage said, uh, said, everything is different, it's all the same. You've probably heard me say, but I always liked what Einstein said. I said, oh, Mr. Einstein, can you repeat what you just said? He said, well, there's no need for me to repeat what I just said because it's all the same thought. So, yes, I'm changed, I'm different, but it's the same person. It's like a, a tree that it can be on the storm, it can have leaves, the leaves fall off and whatever, but it's always the same tree river that's always flowing. Um, but, uh, of course, I'm different this year than I was last year, but uh, it's the same signature, the same body, the same hand making the drawing. So are you, um, are you creating something? What, what did you do? What did you do when you can't go or you cannot be on a stage and adjust the lighting? You know, this, for anybody who does not, Bob creates work. He does the choreography in the first week or days, then words come on it if they are words. And then half of the time light comes in and custom and you're every second is so beautiful. So now you're in a room, you're at Watermill or you're in Berlin. What did you do? What, how did you create something? Were you able to create? Yes, I, I just did a big work in Saudi Arabia. And um, I did something for the Salva Palace. It's an 18th century mud building. Enormous. And I did a, a, an installation for the whole palace and light and video projections and objects. Uh, and it was all done virtually. So that was a completely new experience for me. I also did something in the financial district uh, in Riyadh. So the palace is in the old, old part of the city and uh, And it was all virtual. You were not there in person. You did it by I computer. Never, I never went to see this stuff. Uh, I, I never went. I did it all virtual. There were, I had a team of some people that I've worked with and some people that I haven't worked with, didn't know. But we were, um, we did it all virtually. To light something virtually was <laughs> not easy because of the way yeah. I mix colors. And, but um, anyway, I never saw it, I'll never see it. Incredible. Did, did, did you learn something? Was there something unexpected that you felt? Yeah, I, I, I kept thinking I would pull out and I wouldn't do it. But then I thought, well, it was a challenge. To do something uh, I had never done before. In 1965, I had been asked to uh, direct a group of delinquent kids in San Antonio, Texas, 
for the Hemisphere Fair. Mm -hmm. And this is through uh, Howard Klein and the Rockefeller Foundation. A grant was given to bring a group of delinquent kids from Latin America and then a group of delinquent kids from North America together and create something for this hemisphere fair. And we moved to build sculptures and various things. And uh, so to build sculptures, we had, uh, had ordered materials, tape measures, hammers, saws, different materials that we could work with. And as it turned out, the materials never arrived. But the support of the young kids from Latin America and from North America arrived, and they arrived. So the director of the fair said, you know, what are you going to do? And so we went to a junkyard and we found materials. And so you, you think, well, to put two boards together, you need a hammer and a nail. But actually, if you don't have a hammer, if you don't have a nail, you can put two boards together. You can tie them together with a, a tree vine. And find other ways of binding them together. So that we uh, we found ways of we managed to get um, an advertising company who gave us billboards, and we had a dozen billboards throughout San Antonio, and the kids. We got paint donated and we painted these billboards. And the kids could paint whatever they wanted on the billboard. So if you're driving through one of the freeways in San Antonio, you would see this big painting that a kid from Brazil had made, painted. So the, we, so much of education is the idea of how to do something. And uh, you see in this case that we had to invent a way of doing things. So the conventional idea of a hammer and a nail to put two boards together was just an intellectual idea. There are many ways that it can be done. And it was, it was one of the dilemmas uh, very often in, in education that it becomes very intellectual. Not that it shouldn't, but the, 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 the other ways to, to think about whatever it is that we want to do. Hmm. I'm now making a uh, go next week to Germany, to Dusseldorf. I'm doing uh, a version, kind of version of uh, Dorian Gray. I think it's actually turning out to be more about Francis Bacon. Uh, and I'll do it in the Schauspiel House in Dusseldorf. I will be 80 years old in uh, October, and uh, four events that uh, I will be doing for, in celebration of my 80th birthday in, in Paris. I'm going to do something at the Paris Opera. I'll do something, uh, uh, a dance piece with Lucinda Child and. Uh, Jennifer Cole, classical violinist, playing Bach. Um, and we're, we're going to do uh, 
sound and circulation and sound chapelle. How do you feel about be becoming 80? I feel old. I guess uh, I'm actually 80 years old. I I feel like I'm you know, still two years old. <laughs> yeah. And during this lockdown, I made some drawings. I said to my assistant, I've been drawing one of the things I've done consistently throughout my life. I had paper and I was going to make some drawings with ink there. I said, yeah, I feel like I don't know how to do it, what to do. I often feel that way. If I'm starting a new work, and I don't know how to do it. You just do something and then let that talk to you. And do something else. Do the wrong thing. Mm. Yeah, these, the, these are incredible lessons, and it sounds so easy. You know, like we said before, um, try to find another way to do things, invent something, but do it. Or, or, or as you said now, you know, make a mistake, and and then you say, "I don't know." It's hard to believe, but I believe you. You know, say, "I don't know how I'm going to solve this." You know, that you start out. And, um, and and create something. What what would you say? I mean, we have often young artists, you know, they are from around the world, from Hungary and from Latvia and India or South Africa, listening to our little seagull talks. Um, what do you say to them in this time of Corona? What what from your great experience in life, from your art that has also touched on it? What 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 do you tell them? What is what is it? Forty one years old. Um, I met. Martha Graham, the American choreographer. And I had just come to New York from Texas. And she said, Mr. Wilson, what do you want to do in life? And I said, I have no idea. In fact, uh, Ms. Graham, I don't really do anything well. And uh, she said, Mr. Wilson, if you work long enough and hard enough, you will find something. And that very simple thing has stayed with me. If you work long enough and hard enough, you'll find something. Um, Incredible. Yeah. 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 And she said things. Often I don't look for things, things come to me, right? She was in movements or something. Yeah, she was 89, and I was with her and a man from the New York Times, Mel Gesso, yeah. who's a dance critic. And we had watched a rehearsal that she had made at age 89. And he said to her after the rehearsal, oh, tell me, Miss Graham, what is it like for you to make a ballet? She said, um, I chart the graph of my heart. Incredible. Well, she said in her autobiography, the first line, I am a dancer. I learn by practice. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's important that for everybody to really, really listen to that, you know, practice. Uh, Take your time, work hard, and something you will find something. And I think it's actually it is true. And also, you will find something what speaks to you. I think Rumi, you spoke about a Sufi poet. Rumi said that what you are seeking is also seeking you, but you have to be seeking. Bob, it is incredible that you take took time out, uh, and that we could hear from you in the middle still. You know, of, a, of somehow some kind of a lockdown in theater 
I know the only thing that normally was cutting you down were Christmas holidays in Europe. And you said, why can't we rehearse? And they said, no, Mr. Wilson, it's uh, Christmas. And he said, okay, now whatever, I have to go to Bali or something. But now for such a long time, uh, something was in, but I hope also it recharged a bit and connected you with something you often talked about, watermelon as a diamond. I think you made that drawing in Prat when you were young, you know, and someone from the Bauhaus, uh, Silo Mohol Nagy said, Bob Wilson, what, or the class, do something in five minutes, design a city, and you had a diamond where, in the square where more light would come out than what comes in. That's what a diamond is. You might lose a lot of weight when you cut it a special way, but more light comes out, and you've put in so much, so much energy and time and love and money, but still what comes out of watermill is so, so much more. It's an incredible contribution to contemporary global arts, uh, to the American arts, to the New York arts. And it should be supported. Anybody who supported us, we thank them. Thousands of artists went through the residency, the great open houses at Watermill, the fundraising days. Uh, and uh, so many people have also worked, supported you, but you also inspired them. So we are, um, I'm so happy to, to have heard from you that you took the time and that you were also part of all these 100, 150 artists. Often we have artists from places we haven't heard yet or nobody has seen their work but we feel it's important to listen to everybody so it's a great compliment to anybody who was also with us and i like the idea of the mega structure we at the city want to get involved in the new york city parks and create perhaps in 23 an international global festival for new york i hope you maybe in some way you could help us or be involved or water more could be um, and part of it, we're going to continue next week. This was the very opening of our spring season. We are so really, Bob, honored. And I want to say thank you, Danke and Mercy. Thank that you. you. It's my honor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And next week, we have Olga Garay from Los Angeles Cultural Department for the Doris Duke Foundation, who's been a great supporter of international global work. And she's thinking, how can we get touring uh, done? We have John Glover from the New York Youth Symphony and the on-site opera. Um, he uh, is talking to us about work he does outside uh, or inside in stores that are closed in New York. And, and Peja Musiewicz from uh, the Baryshnikov Art Center, they will talk to us about their work, um, what they are doing at the moment. And we will go on and I hope all uh, our audience members will come back and listen to us. We also an open center, let us know your ideas. And Bob, I hope to see you and I hope to get out to Watermill see the new house, you've created a house for residents and artists, I haven't seen it yet, Noah told me about it, and uh, Roger, the architect, did it, so it's a, an incredible life thing, and it also shows what art can do, what theater can do, but also one person can make such a difference, so Bob, thank you, thank you, Eli, for uh, helping us to arrange all of this, and um, we uh, uh, wish you all the best, and I want you to direct till you're 100, 110. We have better medical help than Martha Graham had now. So keep on, it means a lot to us. It's important what you do. It is meaningful and it's of urgency and of your life experience of having done so much to see what you are doing now is just, is a blessing. So thank you, Bob, and uh, all my best. Okay, thank you, Frank. Great to see you. Great to see you again. Bye-bye, Bob. Thank Bye. you.